My name is Isabella Robbins, and I'm a PhD candidate in the History of Art and American Studies Department at Yale University. I'm also a graduate research assistant at the Yale University Art Gallery in the photo department. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this recording of Given Elder a Mic. Given Elder a Mic is a series started by the Chapter House LA, an Indigenous woman runs an Indigenous woman run arts and community nonprofit. In each iteration, youth speak to elders to share their stories, wisdom, and cultural practices, fostering intergenerational conversations and deeper understandings of contemporary Indigenous experiences. Today's program is a collaboration between the Yale University Art Gallery and the Chapter House in conjunction with Fazil Sheikh Exposures, currently on view at the Yale University Art Gallery until January 8th, 2023. This conversation will feature Regina Lopez Whiteskunk and Shandine Brown. Regina Lopez Whiteskunk was born and raised in southwestern Colorado and currently resides on the Ute Mountain Ute Reservation. She is a member of the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe of Toac. She is a former chair, co chair for the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition and has served on numerous boards and advisory councils. She is currently seeking a Master's of Environmental Management with Western Colorado University. She's also running for Tribal chair, Chairwoman of the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe of Tolac and is serving as a Chair of the Bears Ears National Monument Advisory Committee. Regina has traveled extensively throughout the country sharing Ute culture through dance, song and presentations and is honored to continue to protect, preserve and serve through education, creating a better understanding of resources and culture, a great foundation for a better tomorrow. Shandine Brown is the Rhode Island School of Designs, Design Museum's first Henry Luce curator, Curatorial Fellow for Native American Art. She is an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation from Arizona. Her research interests include indigenous fashion, jewelry, art, and feminism. She is a graduate of Dartmouth College, where she earned her Bachelor of Arts majoring in anthropology, as well as Native American studies and minoring in environmental studies. Previously, she has held positions at the Heard Museum, Hood Museum of Art, Institute of American Indian Arts Museum of Contemporary Native Arts, School for Advanced Research, Indian Arts Research Center, and the Barnes Foundation. Without further ado, let's hear from Regina and Shandine. Thanks so much, Izzy. I also want to give a big ahyeha or thank you to the Yale University Art Gallery, as well as Chapter House LA, and of course to our elder today, Regina Lopez Whiteskunk. Um, before we get started, I also want to introduce myself in Diné or Navajo. Yat e shikisto shidiné e shé. So hi everyone, my name is Shandine um, and I am Towering House and Mini Goats clans from Coppermine, Arizona. So thanks so much everyone and hi Regina. Hi, good morning. Um, so oh, go ahead. I just wanted to take a few minutes to and and to also let people know how important it is for us to introduce ourselves in the manner as Shandine has. And I basically would like to do that um, in respect to also honoring the earth that we walk on so that all of our ancestors and those that have been here before um, hear us as we acknowledge ourselves and, and announce ourselves to those environments. So I'm Regina Lopez White Skunk. I'm a member of the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe. I am of the Uinta and Wimanuch bands of Utes, and I am completely honored so that um, I, I truly thank Shandine for sharing her introduction in Navajo. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited to chat with you today, Regina. Um, I'm wondering if we can maybe start off by you telling us about your childhood and your upbringing um, in the Four Corners area in South um, Southern Colorado. So I was born, actually, I just celebrated a birthday on 9-11, so. Happy birthday. <laughs> thank you. Um, it's, it's truly an honor and it's always a blessing to wake up each morning and to, to know that, you know, there's a new day ahead of us. And growing up in the Southwest here, 
Um, sometimes it wasn't easy, um, but we all know that, you know, with, with the brighter look on a new horizon and what our grandparents teach us is, you know, we, we make each day what, what it is. So we have the power to have a bad day, but we also have a power to have a wonderful day and to seek out the best of it. Um, I have gone to school here in the neighboring town of Cortez the majority of my life and graduated here, but that hasn't always been easy, but it isn't that I didn't have the great guidance and, and constant um, conversations with my family and my parents who always taught us to be positive about things. And living in the Southwest, especially um, when your parent was uh, one of the last to be taken forcibly to the boarding schools, we're products of that. And my father was one of those who was tortured um, and, and beaten not to speak or practice any part of who he is as a Ute man. And his decision was to send my brothers and I to the public school system to learn English, to write English and to understand that. Um, we understand our language. Unfortunately, one of those products of that whole process is I don't speak fluently my mm -hmm. language. And so, you know, those are those are things that we have to navigate and to be able to navigate that in the Southwest where um, encroachment upon our home territorial areas as indigenous people, a lot of that impacted who we are and our identity, our language, and even the understanding of how we participate in our culture. Fortunately enough, my father was raised by his um, grandfather who was a, um, a healer for our people. And so he still practiced and believed in a lot of what was not taken, which privately he prayed, privately he practiced. And as the, the times came forward, he allowed for us to become a part of that, um, knowing that it was on the terms that we would not have any harm come to us. Um, so there's a lot of things that you know, we've had to navigate specifically out here in the Southwest. And I'm sure you know it and have experienced moments where um, it hasn't always felt safe and it hasn't always felt welcoming. But at the end of the day, home is home. This is where our grandparents grew up. This is where many of our ancestors and relatives of yesterday were born. And this is where our life is. Thank you so much, because I feel like, Regina, you touched on a lot of things that sometimes we don't want to talk about or sometimes are uncomfortable to talk about. But I think it's really good for us to have these conversations, you know, about boarding school and language loss um, and the environmental impact. So I'm wondering if you could maybe share a little bit more with our audience about, you know, how was that relationship growing up in your homelands? I know you touched on it a little bit. But I'm thinking about maybe for people who live in cities or areas where they're not in touch with natural environments um, and, you know, those big open skies like we have in the Four Corners area. Um, and, you know, that is also shown in the exhibition and those really stunning images. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about, you know, that um, in your relationship maybe with your homeland? Exactly how we were taught is the land around us and everything that's that's within our natural environment are members of our family. So the mountains, you know, the 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 rivers, even the sky and the clouds, they're all members of our families. And when those things start to disappear and start to change, then we have great concern. Um, we've seen this a lot when Many of the indigenous people became displaced from their traditional and cultural homelands. Um, many times I get asked in the work that I do if I know what the Ute name of certain mountain peaks are. And I try to explain to people, I wish I could tell you what those names are, 
I wish I could say it in my language, but because of many of the processes that, that occurred in the displacement of indigenous people from their traditional homelands, it was like losing a relative, a close family member. And in our culture, we don't speak of, of those that we've lost. Once that grieving process occurs, you don't speak of them out of the sake of letting their souls, letting their spirits and letting their, their essence rest. And so those names aren't spoken in our everyday conversation anymore. Hence, we've lost a lot of that. And, and that's, that's, a, that's a hurtful loss because I would love to be able to share that with my grandchildren. And to say, you know, this is the mountaintop where something occurred and, and I could name it off in our language. But because of that displacement, I don't have that honor or pleasure of sharing that kind of information. I know specifically very few places um, where family members have been born. My father's grandfather who raised him was born out near Disappointment Peak in the Disappointment Valley, which is on the other side of Lizardhead um, Pass here in Southwestern Colorado. There's not many people who can share that type of information and, and those locations, but we probably didn't call it disappointment. We probably had a different name for that. And so, you know, the relationship with land is so important just as a family member is in that makeup. So my next question, Regina, is how do you think um, as Native people, we can best navigate, you know, natural resource extraction in our homelands, which is happening in the Four Corners area and really all over the United States. Um, and we really see it uh, referenced in the exhibition, you know, so many different, um, tribal homelands are being extracted for natural resources, which um, may support us financially, but also causes, you know, this environmental degradation. I see that as a very, very important question that you've asked. And it's so nice to, um, to know that young people, it's on your minds. Um, and for me, as, as my former experience as a, an elected official, I was always really concerned about how the federal government and agencies work with tribal communities in respect to um, approaching these processes. We all know that there's laws and there's certain processes in place and how to do those effectively along the side with tribal communities is a conversation that needs to be better supported. And I think monitored more closely to the point that uh, we need to have a better interaction on a more official basis. We, we need to just strengthen what is called consultation. And I think it needs to be something that's a little more substantial because we're talking about resources. We're talking about our homelands. We're talking about possible sacred sites. Um, and it's been... It's been my understanding, and also I've, I've seen it in several places where um, the land literally is carved up. And when companies are out there, or even when they're doing the cultural clearances um, and they find cultural sites, they're not always respected. They're not always um, taken care of in the manner that they should. And, and sometimes it's more of a, of a sidebar or just a mere technicality. Let's just bypass some of the processes. And this is why there's a lot of, of conversations in the region here about how federal agencies work with tribal um, governments and tribal communities in respect to further development. And, and we get it that we do need the energy, but I think that there's a proper way and, and the, a better conversation that can be had. Yeah, thank you so much for your answer. Um, and I think that might segue us into, could you tell us more about your experience with leadership, not only in Bears Ears, but also um, you're currently running for a councilwoman? Yes, so 
in the capacity of a leader, I think one of the things that I have have been thinking a lot about, especially now, is really how we as tribal communities see and, and define what sovereignty means. And how do we flex that sovereign muscle? But even more so, how do we bring around and bring along the communities to a better understanding of that? I know during the time when I served previously and engaged in the work with um, the campaign to get Bears Ears um, protected and, and um, designated as a national monument, one of the things that a lot of neighboring communities didn't understand was why do tribal communities, tribal governments have that opportunity to engage with federal agencies a little different than county and municipalities. And a lot of it is, is because we have sovereignty on our side and we're listed on a federal registry as recognized tribes and our wards of the federal government, which gives us the opportunity to have those government to government conversations and to further nurture those government to government relationships. And we have to help people become a little more educated as to why tribes are in that capacity. And a lot has to do with understanding history, understanding the impacts that have occurred through the settlements of you know when people were were coming out to establish their homesteads understanding what the the freedom of air act is and how that impacts tribe the same thing about the clean water act all these different things also have embedded in it the opportunity for tribes to be engaged on a sovereign level rather than just consultation but the consultation gets more of the attention and the weight is laid on that. And so as an elected official, I really wanted to see more of the tribal engagement further solidified in capacities that would help pave the way into the future for future leaders to continue to engage in that in a better in a better way that it is more substantial. Um, it's just something that I think without educating ourselves first and foremost, and educating, helping to educate the surrounding communities, it, it's just a struggle rather than a way to move into the future. Thank you. And you know, you talked a lot about sovereignty and consultation. And so I'm curious if we can maybe chit chat more about consultation, because I think in the past, um, Native people weren't seen as um, full people and almost maybe as, um, you know, just not on the same level. And so when we do consultation, I'm also thinking about the work I do at the museum. Um, it's really important to include people and really listen and actively listen, um, not for extraction, but to have those heart-to-heart -heart conversations um, with museum collections and with art. And so um, could you maybe share with the audience some of the positive experiences you've, have, you've had in the past with consultation? Sure, so where I really wanna start from is, is um, about the mid 19, 20s, 1924 specifically, this, that's around the time that Native Americans really started to be looked at in a manner, but we weren't still considered whole or even recognized within the federal government as being human beings. And prior to that, we were looked at as animals, as savages. And so until we actually became citizens of the United States and even of individuals states, we were, we were relatively just kind of just there in the way is more or less what we had. So as times move forward, and, and we began to figure out how um, to establish governments, and we began to become organized within those conversations, then we began to start moving forward within the federal government and agencies and, and other realms, 
um, consultation was something that was looked upon as a way to better engage or even seek approval on different things like um, artifacts. Artifacts are still a big, big issue. Um, you know, being able to seek the proper advisement and guidance from the indigenous people is right, but it's not always followed. Um, sometimes when things are identified and consultation is a way to help guide um, groups that have identified or come across things like that, sometimes it's treated just like a checkbox. Um, I've talked to somebody who comes from that community, check, conversation had. Now those conversations might not be substantial or even provided guidance, which is very concerning for me because then we turn around and we've seen museums display and put up exhibitions where things aren't always identified correctly. And that is important. It's very important, especially if it's a funerary object, for example. We want to make sure that maybe it's not displayed um, and maybe it rather needs to be rested in a safe space rather than displayed for the whole world to see because that's disrespectful to me as an Indigenous person. That's releasing information that I feel maybe shouldn't be on display. And so consultation in that respect um, is very necessary for proper identification. Um, but as I'm kind of, you're hearing, consultation can be two different things. One can be in the realm of um, consulting with tribal leaders, consulting with people of knowledge, and then you also have consultation on a more cultural and um, traditional knowledge base, which this is the realm that a lot of the art um, gets displayed, exhibitions get put together in museums, but regardless, the tribal governments are the ones who are supposed to help um, kind of protect and, and make sure that those conversations are had in a proper manner. Um, so I, I think what really I feel is, is something that needs to be better defined, better um, laid out is really what those consultations are and the differences and how one impacts the other or how one helps to protect the other to preserve those conversations and to ensure those conversations are had in the appropriate way and that can be uh, referenced for for future um, and so consultation is is a huge huge subject um, and I think it's um, it can be spurred off into many directions. My experience with positive consultation are experiences like this, um, being able to share from a very personal um, place, but I, I've also had wonderful opportunities to work with um, History Colorado here in ensuring that certain artifacts are in the proper resting places and not on display. Um, I have had the honor to work with um, the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition to impact um, what consultation can be from a high level and continue to try to provide guidance. Um, that doesn't always guarantee things will be done, but at least I'm, I'm pretty um, excited in the fact that at least the conversations are out there and being had. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, I There are so many things that I wanna ask about from your response, but I think one that's on the top of my head is um, sometimes it seems like the work you do can be emotional, especially with so much you know, past history and trauma and tensions um, with native people and the government and museums. So for you, I'm curious if you could share with our audience ways that you take care of yourself if things get heavy um, and ways that, um, you know, you're doing like self-care. I know that's something really popular that a lot of us are talking about. Thank you for that, that question. Um, and you're absolutely right. A lot of the work can be intertwined emotionally and sometimes 
um, what I've often described as generational um, bags that we carry, you know, on one shoulder, I carry the future, my grandchildren and what we're doing today. And on the other, I still have the generational trauma that's that's occurred that in some ways still hasn't been reconciled. So we still carry a lot of that. And how does one um, take care of oneself? And, and as I mentioned before, early on in our conversation, um, my father was raised by one of our last healers um, within our tribe. And a lot of what my dad has shared and taught with us, as well as many elders, is to fall upon who you are. And, it, and this is one of the reasons why it's important to know who you are and where you come from. I have made the conscious choice to be a part of my cultural um, ceremonies and, and celebrations. And it's through song, it's through my, my dancing, it's through participating in ceremony. Um, and, you know, one of the, the most accessible one for us on many occasions is, is to go into sweat. And that's just taking some time out and doing what my elders have taught us that is a part of many processes and that's just sit still and be quiet and it, in in our language it's called amanik when we hear the word amanik within phrases and conversation that usually means sit quietly and those are times when you spend with self and you give yourself time to to cry, to laugh, um, and to to honor what you're feeling. But in our ways, it's don't hold it in because it's going to make you sick. Um, and so, how do you take care of yourself? Take time out. Be quiet. Be still. And that's one way. Many people might look at that as what many call meditation, um, but for us. That's that's a part of life. That's who we are. That's who we've always been. And that's how I have managed to to man just navigate this crazy world between my traditional cultural uh, ways of being a youth woman, as well as being someone who's contemporary engaged in um, my academic um, endeavors, as well as now pursuing a political um, seat at the table. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and you talked about, you know, cultural traditions. And I'm curious, like, if you could share more about how you feel about cultural art, and how art impacts your life. Absolutely. Art, again, I, I can't say this enough. It's, it's a part of our life. It's who we are. Um, you know, at different times, my artwork and I, I say my artwork pops out. I've, I've had the honor of being able during those moments of where I can sit quietly and my hands can create um, a drawing, um, which I am by no means an artist, but it's because of those moments of getting in touch with who you are and knowing that something needs to come out and be expressed. Um, in that moment, you know, I've been able to to do some um, colored pencil drawings. I've been able to do, you know, some sketches of, of of family members. I don't normally do that, you know, just because I can. I just don't have that natural ability. Um, but it is something that resonates deep inside many Indigenous people. Um, we can take raw materials and create beautiful things, um, beadwork, um, even just creating um, beautiful pieces of pottery and, and different things like that. Um, I was always taught, you know, those are, those are gifts. Those are things that live within you. And these, these are, are very special. I, I give credit to all those who can sit down and just start doing this stuff. Um, as second nature. Um, for some of us, it, it comes from a very deep place. Um, my father, he paints. Um, 
and my brothers and and other family members have created very beautiful beadwork um, and, and things that you know take time and effort. Um, but I think everybody has that sacred healing um, that lives within art. Um, but it's also um, it's a form of storytelling, and this is where um, some of the the elders. Uh, when they're creating their their pieces, they're they're talking and they're sharing, and it comes from a very very sacred place. So for us, art is not necessarily for the sake of the word art. It's really just a part of our life and a form of our short our our storytelling. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And something that is on my mind that my job is as Native people or Indigenous people of, you know, North America, we didn't have a written language um, until settlers and um, European, your Americans came. So the way we communicated was through visual aspects. Um, and so I, I kind of want to segue on to communication because I think, you know, I'm really appreciating this conversation that we're having now, but I often think that sometimes um, we don't talk about things that need to be brought up and this can be in our own native communities it can be in our own families um, because it, it can be uncomfortable so I'm curious if you could share with us some of the ways that you have communicated and navigated uncomfortable topics or um, divisive topics like um, you know I, I come from a community where um, we are really big on coal mining and, and it's a divisive topic. Um, so I'm curious if you could share more about that. Absolutely. So communication, and, and I'm, I really love the whole idea of how art still plays into that. Um, many of us will create something and as a way to communicate how we're feeling, we put a lot of that energy into that piece. And um, when you look at forms of communication, I always say that one of the reasons we need to protect the petroglyphs up the canyon was that was our biggest form of communication. But in today's world, it's referred to as rock art. Um, but if you look at it, that's not only rock art, that's documentation, that's communication from a different time when our people were out on the land. It's beautiful to look at, but the more spiritual side of it is standing before them and really taking in that moment and seeing what you see and hearing and communicating and knowing the knowledge that is in that, what is now called rock art, what, what was communicated. And, you know, when we take those moments to sit and try to figure out how can I do something to communicate what this moment is, to make sure that it's documented for another time, what would those next generations be understanding in that? Um, today, we have a lot of things that we use in technology web based stuff, uh, websites. Um, writing a book, uh, something that I have found that has been truly impactful for me has been um, engaging with other authors that might be writing about um, certain places and times, um, specifically about controversial um, topics like Bears Ears. Bears Ears was probably one of the most controversial topics in this region. And how did I navigate that? I collaborated with a lot of um, authors that were writing either books or um, I wrote op-eds for newspapers. I've um, been able to engage not only tribal communities, but communities in the form of many collection of smaller communities together. And, um, we can't always think about and focus entirely on the spoken conversation because sometimes that is so controversial and heated that it doesn't make any headway, but it creates more animosity between people. And that's one of the ways I've 
experienced some of that form of communication, but I've also figured out that if I write, I can get what I feel out there in a safe manner um, that many people can read and sit quietly with what I have presented or communicated. Um, so writing for me has been um, one of the most impactful ways that I can communicate without uh, maybe violence or or that type of reaction. Yeah, thank you. I was thinking like that connection between writing and then before when you were sharing on, you know, being quiet and meditating, because I think sometimes in conversation, if you're heated, you know, you just say the thing that's at the top of your head, but the really beautiful thing about writing is taking your time and really um, listening. And now I'm excited after this program to go read your op-eds, Regina. Um, for any young people out there, do you have advice on writing as someone who sometimes struggles with writing, right. I'm asking? <laughs> My advice to young people about writing is just being truthful to yourself and what you're feeling. Um, the beautiful thing about writing is you can write it. And if you're not happy, you don't have to, you can burn it, you can do whatever. And it could be your own little ceremony of, of healing. Um, but then you can also write things and present them to the newspaper, um, write in collaboration with your fellow students or other people in the community. Um, but the beautiful thing about writing is you can take it as far as you want, or you can take it in a more healing capacity. Like maybe you write down some, some thoughts that maybe you didn't want to, or you don't want to harm anybody, but rather you got to get it out. So let's just rip it up, burn it and do your own little healing ceremony. And then, you know, start anew. Um, I, I love that, that writing gives you a little bit of time to reflect on what it is that you want to take beyond yourself. Um, mm -hmm. and so it, it, it has been its form of healing for me, but it also has been its form of activism for myself and, and helping others to better understand, um, what it is I have learned and a little bit of my life and how I would like to, to carry things forward or how I would like some generations down the road to read what I was feeling in this moment or what, what was occurring around me. Um, that's probably one of the things that I truly um, move forward with writing for myself is, is I can't write on the canyon walls but I can write on a piece of paper um, in a language that many people can understand. That's beautiful thinking about, um, you know, future generations reading that. It's, it's a really great thought. Um, and, and you brought up the word activism. So I wanna ask about why you have taken that route to be involved with activism. Um, and what that means to you, you know, on a um, personal level? Well, activism, when I first was serving on the, on the tribal council for the Ute Mountain Ute tribe was far from my mind. But when I got involved with the Bears Ears um, initiative very early on, I was asked to testify in um, committee in Salt Lake City for the state legislatures. And I was treated very poorly, um, actually very disrespectful. And I never got out of my introductory statement. I never even gave my testimony. Um, and it was in that moment that I quickly understood uh, the challenges of just being a female indigenous leader in these spaces. It was that conversation, it was that experience that really lit the fire under my activism that I would become more involved in after I would leave leadership. Because it was those moments that defined the areas that I seen I needed to make sure people were aware of and, and gained a better understanding that it isn't 
we we know we don't live in a fair world, but does that mean you treat me any less than human? And I see things that in a different manner, I wouldn't want you as a young lady or my granddaughters as younger ladies to ever experience. And so my capacity in activism is I would, I would like to prepare a better path and place for you all to create your own areas of where you would like to see the world better and have that opportunity to be considered more than just an animal, but rather a human being that has the same equal space to raise your voices. Thank you. Um, you know, as Native women, I think we know how to get stuff done. Um, and a lot of us um, are hard workers and, and, and seek that change that you're talking about so um is there like you know one piece of advice that you could give to native women of any ages or indigenous women of any ages um that you think could help them oh absolutely um you know i think the biggest part that we often don't give credit to is the wisdom and the processes of um, when we become young ladies, when we go through those ceremonies of entering womanhood, those are really the foundation, fundamental skills that give you your identity as a woman, because you know your place in family, you know your place in home, you know your strength as every part within every bone and muscle that gets described to you in these ceremonies, know who you are and believe in it and embrace it. Um, being brown, being indigenous, being who you are and being true to yourself, really, we have it in us. It's just finding that in those moments of quietness and, and bringing those forth with courage and being brave about who you are. Um, we know who we are. We just need to take our places. Um, I have a question for you, Shandy. Yes. <laughs> so in your, in your area, what would, from your viewpoint and experience, what would you like to see in leaders um, that may help you to be who you are, whether that's traditional or or even in your academic um, endeavors. How, what what did what would you like to see in a leader? Well, thanks. Thank you so much for asking that. Um, I think there's two things that come up at the top of my head. One is like active listening. Like sometimes I think when we ask questions. Um, we might not be so ready for the answer, but thinking what's our response gonna be next? And so I think with leadership, I really appreciate when my leaders ask me questions and listen, um, and they really listen, like actively listen. Um, and also I think that goes in tandem with the second part, which is um, being open-minded, um, whether in a, cultural context or a political context or even with art being really open-minded um, and sometimes you know I've had a closed heart about things um, so I know we can all do it but being open-minded to things that might be different or uncomfortable um, even like we were talking about open-minded to conversations that might be uncomfortable you know um, it's sometimes I feel like in native families or communities we just we're we're closed mouth we don't want to talk about it but being active listeners and also being open-minded, I think is a pathway towards healing. And again, towards like getting stuff done, um, which are things that we, we just so desperately need. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my answer. Thank you, Regina. Thank you. I think in the capacity that I'm in today, um, I really, especially with, with my new um, role as a chair for the uh, Bears Ears National Monument um, Management Advisory Committee, I need to hear feedback. 
I need to hear feedback from people in general. And that has become a little bit more of my repertoire where I want to actively listen. I need to, because I don't want my leadership to reflect my personal agenda. I need it to reflect everybody's. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think I'm going to ask one question, one more question, and then we're going to wrap it up. Um, so Regina, for young people in particular who are listening to this, what is some advice that you could give them in this crazy world with all this stuff going on? Um, what is one thing maybe if when you were younger that you really could have benefited from hearing? I am a big dreamer and I have big dreams. And growing up, I would have loved to heard more encouragement and nurturing in helping me to get through those dreams. I might have achieved things a little sooner in life um, had I heard the encouragement and support from people that might be big dreamers. Dream big, push hard, and always never, never give up always keep looking to tomorrow because at some point you as a young person will become an elder and you as an elder will become the wise and and the advice givers and the guidance givers so dream big because tomorrow who knows thank you regina so i want to again give a big thank you to yale university art gallery uh, Chapter House LA and Regina. Thank you so much. Thank you.